Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome dear friends, in the previous module we had looked at the early manifestations of Bua's philosophy through an analysis of some of her creative writings and essays. Today we shall begin our discussion of the second sex, the most important and is still undervalued contribution of Bua. It is a foundational text in contemporary feminism and queer theory. Deeply embedded in the European traditions of philosophy, especially phenomenology and existentialism, the second sex rests on two connected specifically feminist philosophical innovations. Firstly, the gendering of phenomenological experience and secondly, the positing of an original and innovative question for existential ontology. What is a woman? The second sex was originally written and published in French in 1949. It defines the fundamental operation of women by men, characterizing them at every stage as the other and defined exclusively in opposition to men. Men occupies the role of the self or subject, woman is the object the other. If he is essential absolute, and transcendent, she is inessential, incomplete and mutilated. Whereas a man extends out into the world to impose his will on it, a woman is doomed to immanence or inwardness and this distinction is the basis of Bua's arguments. Two English translations of this seminal book are available to us. The first one was by Howard Parshley which came out in the USA in 1953. The second was published in 2009 by Constance Borde and Sheila Melovny Chevalier. Howard Parshley was a retired zoologist who was commissioned to do the translation in a truncated form. So, he had cut down around 15 percent of the original volumes. As Francis Gray has commented, it was this truncated text that ushered two generations of women into the universe of feminist thought, inspiring pivotal later books like Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique and Kate Millett's Sexual Politics. In 1946, when Bua had begun to write her landmark study of women, legislation allowing French women to vote was little more than a year old. Birth control could be legally denied to them until 1967. In Switzerland, women would not be enfranchised until 1971 and such repressive circumstances account for both the fierce urgency of Bua's book and the vehement controversies it aroused when it was first published in France. The Vatican placed it on the index of forbidden books. Albert Camus complained that Bua made Frenchmen look ridiculous. The psychiatrist Karl Menninger found it pretentious and tiresome. Some exceptions were also there. For example, the novelist Philip Wiley eulogized it as one of the few great books of our era. In the introduction to the book, Bua points to the essentialism of women by referring to different notions and practices that reduce her to a womb and try to put her within fixed categories. Man is considered as both positive 
and a universal category, while woman is thought of as a negative category. The quote from the second sex, which is given below, further explains it in detail. The second sex identifies the ways in which the myth of woman hides the diversity of women belonging to different races, classes, etc. It also argues against the either or frame of the woman question that means either women and men are equal or they are different. It argues for equality for women while insisting on the reality of the sexual differences. She finds it unjust and immoral to use the sexual difference as an argument for women's subordination. As a phenomenologist, she is obliged to examine women's unique experiences of their bodies and to determine how these experiences are co-determined by what phenomenology calls the everyday attitude. As a feminist phenomenologist, assessing the meanings of the lived female body, Bua explores the ways that cultural assumptions frame women's experience of their bodies and alienate them from their body's possibility. Woman is identified through negation. A woman is not man. She is not this or not that. She is always defined with a lack. Bua also emphasizes that we need to recognize sexual differences and these differences exist and are part of the lived reality of women. The book opens with the question, what is a woman? And defines the historicity of the question by referring to several philosophers of the Western canon. The introduction also explores questions of alterity concerning historical situations of dominance and subordination. Bua has defined alterity as the fundamental category of human thought. In the conflicting sexual binary, woman is the other and Bua feels that it tends to cast suspicion upon all the justifications that men have ever been able to provide for it. Analyzing the philosophical traditions and also the prevalent cultural norms, Bua somehow feels that every female human being is not necessarily a woman and that categories exist amongst female human beings. Some of them may be considered as a woman, some of them may not necessarily be considered as a woman. As to be so considered, a female human being must share in that mysterious and threatened reality known as femininity. Bua argues that historically, men have sought to make the fact of their supremacy a right creating laws that turned into principles. She argued that gender, the social structure that positions women as inferior, has organized human societies far longer than capitalism or any other modern form of government. Therefore, women's subordination cannot be explained as a product of other social systems. It is, in her opinion, a social process in and of itself. She concludes the introduction by emphasizing that change can only occur when vague notions of inferiority, superiority and equality are abundant. This perspective was groundbreaking because it questioned the very existence of women's unequal position rather than taking it as non-essential or an epiphenomenal outcome of other social institutions. In the next slide, we have a video interview that Bua gave in 1975 explaining the dilemma of women. It is a rare video interview by Jan Schreiber. Bua emphasizes the history of womanhood and the power struggle between different genders. Exploitation or oppression, that suppose qu'il y ait une volonté à un moment donné. Ce n'est pas simplement accidentel. Alors, est-ce que Où retracez-vous l'origine de, de cette volonté sur le plan historique et, et comment, à votre avis, se manifestait-elle de la part des hommes oh, Ça remonte à la nuit des temps. Je crois qu'il faut partir de l'idée que, comme on a dit, le mettant le pour l'homme, il existe la rareté, il n'y a pas assez pour tout le monde. Alors les plus forts, et il y a eu un moment dans la nuit des temps où la force physique, ça comptait énormément, les plus forts se sont appropriés 
euh, les droits, le pouvoir, de manière à avoir également de la prééminence économique, grossièrement pour être ceux qui étaient toujours sûrs de manger. C'était très visible en Chine, par exemple, où il y avait une grande pauvreté, et vous laissez mourir si non, on, on tuait les petites filles, et vous empêchez les femmes de participer à la production, de manière à ce que l'homme ait vraiment tout en main. Ça a été comme ça toujours, et ça, je n'ai pas le temps de raconter ici toute l'histoire de la femme, mais il est bien évident que d'époque en époque, il y a eu toujours une volonté des hommes de prendre le pouvoir. Je n'en citerai qu'un exemple. Au Moyen-Âge, et dans les siècles, enfin, à la Renaissance, les femmes avaient beaucoup de pouvoir comme médecins. Elles connaissaient des quantités de remèdes, des herbes, des, des remèdes qui étaient des remèdes de bonne femme et quelquefois très valables. Eh bien, la médecine leur a été prise des mains par les hommes. Toutes les persécutions contre les sorcières ont été essentiellement fondées sur cette volonté des hommes d'écarter les femmes de la médecine et du pouvoir qu'elles donnent. Et ensuite, alors, au XVIIIe, au XIXe siècle, il y a des statuts faits par les hommes qui interdisent rigoureusement, sous peine de prison, d'amende, etc., aux femmes d'exercer la médecine si elles ne si elles n'ont pas suivi euh, certaines écoles auxquelles, par-dessus le marché, on les, ne on les acceptait pas. Alors, les femmes, à ce moment-là, se sont reléguées au rôle de Florence Nightingale, au rôle d'infirmière, au rôle d'aide assistante, etc. Et vraiment, il y a des ouvrages intéressants là-dessus. On voit comment il y a eu une volonté, puisque vous parliez de volonté, une volonté des hommes d'arracher la médecine aux femmes. Je pense que si on prenait d'autres domaines, on trouverait tout à fait les mêmes processus. Il y a donc, en effet, une volonté... Et maintenant, cette volonté n'est peut-être plus de prendre, mais c'est en tout cas une volonté très, très, très forte de garder. Il y a des barrages qui se font partout lorsque les femmes veulent accéder à certaines qualifications ou à certains pouvoirs. She also notes in the interview how historically women were refused power and knowledge in certain domains. For example, branded as witch by various socio-religious legal discourses, women were prevented from practicing medicine for several centuries. The second sex is divided into two volumes. Volume 1 consists of facts and myths, which has an introduction and three parts. The first part of the introduction is I. Thus, the reader is introduced to the unconventional nature of a seemingly academic work as the narrator announces herself informally in the first person. Moreover, she is identified by her sex. The first volume consists of three parts and is further subdivided into chapters in these three parts. The first part of volume one is titled Destiny. It is further subdivided into three chapters. Chapter one with the title of Biological Data considers females in the animal world in order to consider the unique nature of human females. This chapter opens with a simple definition, woman is a womb, an ovary. Insult or exaltation in terms of the male version roots woman in nature and confines her within her sex. Bua also concludes that sexual differentiation cannot be deduced at the cellular level, but with respect to reproduction, differentiation occurs as an irreducible and contingent fact. This section, however, does not provide any reasons of sexual hierarchy. Chapter 2 is titled as the psychoanalytic point of view, which presents Bua's criticism of the Freudian approach to sexuality in women, particularly his notion that girls are developmentally delayed and thus prone to remaining in an infantile state or developing neurosis. One can say that triad here echoes the male tradition of philosophers of Aristotle or Saint Aquinas or the medieval scientific assertions. Bua systematically opposes the Freudian notions, disabling the psychoanalytic reliance on sexuality as the basis of personality and the accompanying insistence on anatomy as destiny. Bua comments on the psychoanalytic recognition of difference with respect to masculine and feminine behaviors of which she insists both sexes are capable. Making a myth of psychoanalytic narratives and preferring choice over psychoanalytic determinism, she notes that a girl climbing a tree is not emulating her father, nor is she exhibiting virile behavior when she paints, writes, or engages in politics. These activities are not only good sublimations, as Freud has termed, but ends desired in themselves. 
Freud had described femininity as a dark continent and had never resolved the question of the wants of a woman. Jacques Lacan had later focused on the notion of the girl's unresolved sexuality and his positive assessment of the developmental hesitations in girls is a significant revision of Friot who had labelled it as infantile and incomplete. Boer asserts that women's sexual initiation begins in trauma necessarily requiring a masculine intervention. She takes up those aspects of feminine experience like frigidity that remain conventionally unspoken but are foundational to identity and perspective. Chapter 3 critiques historical materialism which opposes the defining of woman as a sexed organism only and puts forward the argument that women's work and the society's economic structure determine her identity. Boer refers to Engel's argument presented in his 1884 publication, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, wherein he has chronicled the importance of women in the Stone Age. A primitive division of labor meant equality between the sexes, which led to discovery, for example, of metals and inventions, for example, the plow, private property and slaves. However, it also gradually led to what has been termed as the great historical defeat of the female sex by Engels. Gradually, after the invention of private property, changes occurred. Women were restricted to housework, dominated by men. The replacement of maternal right with paternal also came across, as well as the transmission of property from father to son rather than from woman to her clan. But as Boer points out, a woman is not simply a worker and there are times during which her ability to reproduce is as important as her ability to produce. Engels had wanted to eliminate the family in a socialist state, enabling women to work. However, Boer has dismissed this theory as being superficial as it does not account for how these values developed in the first place. She points to factors shaping women's conditions that lie outside labor distribution, for example, childbirth and sexuality, because these are not accounted for by historical materialists like Engels. She believes it is necessary to go beyond this theory in order to fully explain women's condition in society. Boer, however, says that it is impossible to deduce women's operation from private property. She sees a chain reaction citing the imperialism of human consciousness. She posits that equality between the sexes necessarily begins in the shared enterprise of meaningful work. Thus, we see that Boer rejects Friard's sexual theories and Engels' economic theories on almost the same basis. As psychoanalysts have based everything in sexuality, whereas historical materialists have based everything in economic situation. Bua believes that the real answer lies somewhere in the middle. We will look at the second part of volume 1 now. Part 2 with the title of history consists of 5 chapters. The first chapter discusses the pre-agricultural world where presumably women worked as hard as men. Bua begins this section with the statement that this world has always belonged to males and none of the reasons given for this have ever seemed sufficient. By writing this, she reiterates her central thesis that men have controlled women's narratives. She also takes a stronger stance in this section on previously cited explanations for gender dynamics. Whereas the first section considered alternative explanations for differences in gender, this section dismisses earlier theories as being insufficient. Rather, Bua intends to provide her own take on history without consulting others' work as much as she did in the previous section. Bua speculates that in the pre agricultural world, women must have worked as hard as men and also accompanying them in battle. However, 
physical strength which was a key value for survival was limited for women by the reproductive demands placed upon them. It resulted in their continued dependence on men for protection and sustenance. Motherhood left to women reverted to her body like an animal and made it possible for men to dominate her and also later on to dominate nature. A women's lives are characterized as being repetitious throughout their childbearing years while men's lives become creative. To be biologically destined to repeat life or to live life within the confines of a procreative life that is living in sight is termed as immanence. The second chapter explores women's roles in the agricultural world in which women perhaps had certain stature because of their childbearing capacity as there was a need for large number of children to work the land. During this era, many tribes had also remained matrilineal as they recognized the importance of the mother in the birth and care of children and also because they did not have much knowledge of the father's role in procreation. However, Bua believes like Levi Strauss that for men, women are not peers. In their mystery, women are other and should always be under male's guardianship according to the patriarchal logic. As man gains land, wealth and slaves, women are gradually deprived of their domestic duties also, making them gradually redundant. By dominating the world, men triumph over women and women and children become possessions like the land. Bua also claims that the story of the devaluation of women represents a necessary stage in the history of humanity. The third chapter speculates on women's loss of prestige with the advent of private property. This chapter also lists the shifts in women's situation as patriarchy makes adjustment to local customs and laws. Bua holds that once woman is dethroned by private property, her fate is linked to it for centuries. Owing nothing, she is hardly a person at this stage. She can be disowned at will. Male prenuptial chastity is not a value and a husband's adultery is not judged severely. The advent of private property helped men to define women as property which also led them to value sexual fidelity as they wanted their own children to be the possessors of their worldly gains. Bua raises questions of women's right to private property and inheritance as patriarchy makes adjustments to local custom and law. A problem, for example, for societies founded in Ignition had been the family without a male heir. Bua compares the historical positions of women in Greece where women did not have any freedom and Rome where despite certain freedom, women did not have any means of gainful employment often resulting in hedonism, inner vacancy and gluttony. Bua thus concludes that happiness is not the necessary component or condition of freedom. Value in life is a matter of surpassing freedom by transcending life through existence. Freedom begins in individual choice. Women need to have the courage, imagination and also proper legal circumstances in order to find their proper place in the world. The fourth chapter of part two demonstrates further instability in women's standing and Bua notes the role of Christianity in further diminishing women's position in marriage and also in the church. Bua suggests that Christianity has further abated the subordination of women. For example, St. Paul writes, that for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Also, the story of the virgin birth acknowledges that woman's body is dirty and a place of sin. During the medieval ages, women's situation remained stagnant, though cultural norms sometimes gave certain relaxations. And Bua has quoted the example of German families where after marriage, within the marriage, women have certain rights and certain semblance of independence. 
She also points out that with the abolishment of serfdom, rural communities also developed in which spouses lived on equal footing, each doing work to sustain the family. The fifth chapter remarks that economic independence is a necessary condition for women's equality with men. She begins by citing individual efforts of women during the French Revolution and records that in 1791, a French writer, Olympe de Gauche, proposed a declaration of the rights of women and the female citizen. She had also founded a newspaper which was able to print a certain number of editions. Boa said that in the 19th and 20th century, Participation in production and freedom from reproductive slavery explain the evolution of women's condition. She also notes that after 1890s, women have rallied for reproductive rights, divorce initiated by women and suffrage. She also notes that it has been a long and arduous battle for women and records that it was only in 1897 that the French women were able to win the right to testify in court. She also regrets that women's history has been written exclusively by men and throughout history women either could not or would not act for their own benefit. Boer recognizes the significance of industrial revolution in providing women an escape from their homes, still she finds that they were paid little. She also relates the history of women's suffrage and writes that women like Rosa Luxemburg and Mary Curie brilliantly demonstrate that it is not women's inferiority that has determined their historical insignificance. Rather, it is their historical insignificance that has doomed them to inferiority. The third part of volume 1 is titled Myths. It consists of three chapters. In the first chapter, Bua establishes her central theories regarding how men have mythologized women. She begins by reiterating that men established women as the other in order to subjugate her economically and also that it suited their ontological and moral ambitions. The first volume of Bua's autobiography, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, had also critiqued certain oppressive myths which have dominated women's lives. However, in the second sex, she makes a clear distinction between myths and facts with respect to women's situation. The philosophical tradition, which is supposed to be crucial for men, creates others for itself, women, the masses, children. Boa says that historically, men have always controlled the powers and since the earliest days of their patriarchate, they have thought it best to keep women in a state of dependence. There are governing myths, cultural beliefs transmitted through familiar stories, legends, fairy tales, folk tales that convey certain beliefs and mental habits regarding the inferiority of women to posterity. Men have not only written the history of women, but they have also defined the mythological substructure of their inferiority. It is crucial in forcing women into an inessential object position. Bua refers to the most dominant biblical myth, the story of Eve, who was never an equal for Adam. Since the very beginning, we find that Eve's potential as an individual is irrelevant. She is only a convenience for Adam a thing, an object. Twenty years later, we find that Kate Millett has echoed similar sentiments, commenting that patriarchy has got on its side in her work, Sexual Politics, which was published in 1970. Boer postulates that the subordination of women serves the economic interest of men and also suits their moral ambitions, and myths have supported such ideas. The objectification of women and the generalizations that define them are common in myths across human culture. Bua investigates certain myths, including the myth of women as nature, in her roles as mother, spouse, and 
idea. And nature is both life and death. Nature is the fertile material souls from which men's existence emerged, is sustained and which is transformed by man in his image at will to suit himself. Through man's projections, woman also comes to embody nature as mother, spouse or idea and each takes on the duality and contradictions that man perceives in his own existence. Like nature, woman is ambiguous, she inhabits contradictions, she is both the solidified immanence and the nothingness of existence that allows for transcendence. Woman's ambiguity makes her seem magical. Mother Earth is both life and death and the oft-cited masculine fear of the feminine is rooted in such myths of power and loss of control. In the myth of woman as nature is spouse, nature is seen as a spouse by man. He finds that all natural objects have feminine essence. This myth is man's projection of woman as a magical and sixth object suitable to be conquered and possessed through a man's virility. In each of these myths, the woman as a bringer of life and death represents the hopes and fears of men. As a bringer of life, she is a symbol of hope. She is the mother who births men in physical as well as existential sense. She is the material souls that brings the nothingness of existence into this world and along with it the possibility of transcendence. As a spouse, she is the material souls on which men act to achieve transcendence. As a bringer of death, she is a symbol of fear and as a spouse, she reduces man to finite flesh. In these myths, woman is entirely denied the subject status as well as the ability to transcend beyond herself. Locked into immanence, into her facticity, her situation created through man's transcendence, she is all of nature's passive and inert objects that man can act on and transform at will. Man transcends beyond himself in creating the myth of woman as nature in different manifestations. In contrast, woman has no myths of her own. Bua asserts that these myths are world making. For Bua, a woman is all which is inessential, wholly the other. Her stories, her mythic identity have been constituted for her by him. In the second chapter of part 3, Bua analyzes five major novelists to show how most tend to mythologize women and reinforce her status as other. The list includes contemporary writers, Montherland, Ditch Lawrence, Claudel and Breton. The one exception to this list is slightly older writer Stenthal, whom she credits for depicting women as true human beings. Bua believes that with the exception of Stenthal, these writers have represented women as reflection of collective myths. They show men as the destiny of women. A woman is required in every case to forget herself in her love to a man. The other or woman is shown as a reflection of the ego and ideas of men. For example, Bantherlein's work reduces women to objects of masculine disgust. Lawrence, while elevating the masculine, also has enduring faith in the feminine. Still, women are always subjugated by the male virility. Claudel's women are loyal, faithful, sweet and humble, in other words, resigned. Britain also does not speak of women as a subject. Stendhal, in comparison, has been termed as a tender friend of women by Bua. He is capable of creating women characters whose identities are made by their specific experiences and needs. He avoids the mythic woman disguised as shoe, nymph, morning star or mermaid. These writers expect women to be altruistic in ways that are not required of men. She concludes that these male novelists tend to depict a woman as a privileged other. In the third chapter, Bua considers how these myths affect 
everyday life. She defines the difference between static myths and concrete reality. Static myths provide a certain idea to man who then attempts to project it onto different situations. In concrete reality, women cannot be encompassed by a single idea. They manifest themselves in numerous ways. Boa feels that literature propagates different kinds of myths about women and womanhood. The idea of the eternal feminine which presents an abstract concept of timeless and unchangeable feminine essence as absolute truth clashes with the day to day experiences of flesh and blood women. She comments that the eternal feminine fiction is reinforced by biology, by psychoanalysis, history and literature. Besides, women are portrayed in contrary archetypes simultaneously. They may be evil employing their erotic attraction or guardian angels or courtesans being generous patronesses for poets and artists. Bua asserts that there is no secret essence of femininity. It simply does not exist. Human beings in their real essence can never be defined in objective essence. She also opines that the myths in large part are explained by their usefulness to men. They help in self-justification of regressive customs and social modes and further imbue the psyche through movies, religions, traditions, languages, tales, songs and other social institutions. We can also refer to the contemporary myths to propagate patriarchal values as displayed in this photograph of the myth of Disney princess. Bua refers to women's relation to means of production. Means of production are owned by men and it imparts a dominance to them, enabling them to look at the other from an exalted position. The oppressed women learn to hide their real feelings and are taught from adolescence to lie to men. Thus, women live between their subjectivity and their otherness essentially facing oneself as other and accepting the bargain with experience is the beginning of relief. Bua concludes, quoting Lefraj, that women will become fully human only when woman's infinite servitude is broken. Bua notes that disabling the myth of woman is not a panacea for an androgynous future. Given the realities of embodiment, there will be sexual differences. She hopes that these differences will not be used to justify the difference between a subject and his inessential other. The goal of liberation, according to Bua, is our mutual recognition of each other as free and as other. In the next module, we will discuss the second volume of the second sex. In it, Bua analyzes the socialization of men and women in the context of her discussion of the myths that we have discussed today. Thank you.